their health so far. So as Ruth said, um, on behalf of Trim GAA, LGFA and the Camogie Association, you're all very welcome to our webinar this evening, which is called Letting Go of What You Can't Control. And it's with the very inspirational um, Brian Penny. For those of you who I haven't got to meet yet down the club, um, my name is Derek O'Boyle. I blew into Trim about 15 years ago and I've stayed and I'm very happy now to call it my home. Um, and I've been a member of Trim GA for the last number of years, supporting from a mentorship and coaching with the juvenile and nursery side. And I'm also a member of Trim GAA Healthy Club Committee. Um, and as Ruth alluded to there, there a number of minutes number of minutes ago, and um, this all this webinar all came about because a number of people in the club kind of sat back and said, right, the gates are closed. We can't play our games. We can't train. The social piece isn't there, which is huge for everybody. That connection piece isn't there. So what can we do for our members from a mental health and a social health perspective, which is two pillars of the GAA Healthy Cub uh, manifesto? What can we do for our members, for our players, for our parents? But also, what can we actually do for the community within which we live? Um, so there are some guests um, and participants I know that are on the call this evening that aren't necessarily involved in Trim GAA, but they're living within the community and you're all very welcome to listen this evening and we're very happy to have you. So over the next 20 minutes, Brian, if you've listened to Brian before, whether it's on the Sheila Show, Get Ready to Be Real podcast on 2FM um, as a corporate speaker, as a TED talker, he is full of energy and he's really, really inspirational. And I suppose the reason we reached out to Brian was because um, let's face it, it feels like we're in month 562 of this lockdown. Um, even the most resilient of us um, will admit that this lockdown in particular has just feel so much tougher. And um, from a mental perspective, it's heavier. People are getting a lot more overwhelmed. The feedback from our players and from our club members and from the community when we reached out was everybody was just kind of feeling low. And while, yes, there is light at the end of the tunnel, um, this particular lockdown has been quite tough. So uh, Brian's story is inspirational because he's come over a massive hurdle with his addiction. He got a second chance at life and he's rebuilt his life block by block. And along the way, he's learned a load of lessons from a positive mindset perspective, from a positive mental health perspective and from changing their perspective, that inner critic and the self-talk and really kind of designing a blueprint for success in your life and understanding that change is always possible, no matter how stuck you might feel at the moment. So out of this evening, I'm really excited about it because anytime I've listened to Brian or seen him, I've always come away with a couple of takeaway tools and I've no doubt that this evening will be any different. So I've no doubt that the takeaway tools will work, whether it's in your relationships, it's in work, it's on the pitch, it's off the pitch, it's in school, it's in college. Um, but I'm really excited about tonight. So as Ruth mentioned, we do have a chat box. And um, if you've any questions, post them up. After about 20 minutes, when Brian has brought us through his story, or 25 minutes-ish, close to about the 25 past seven mark, we're going to be going into an interactive Q&A. We have a couple of questions already in. They're fantastic questions, and Brian's going to answer them. And if you've anything else, throw them up in the box. We get through as many as we can. And Ruth is also going to throw up a couple of links um, and the first of the links, if you can bear with me for a moment, it's the IACP.ie website. Say that one 10 times fast. It's the Irish Association of Counselors and Psychotherapists. And it's a fantastic resource that if anything resonates with anyone here this evening and they'd like to reach out to a professional to speak about mental health or stress or anxiety or they're struggling and are just looking for some professional support, the IACP is a fantastic resource. You can click in your county code and you'll get a big list of all the therapists and psychotherapists in your area that are happy to chat. And um, we also have a couple of addiction services resources from Andy Ogle. And I know Brian is really, really generous with his time and his experience. We'll have a link for Brian up and um, for some of his courses, his program for life. But also if anyone wants to reach out and just ask a couple of questions, Brian is happy to get back to you. Um, and finally, Brian has written a book I can tell you it's fantastic. And I'm not saying that because he's on the call. I think I've watched all of Netflix at this stage throughout lockdown. So I'm devouring books and his book was fantastic. Um, and our local independent bookshop, Antonia Navigate there has been really kind and generous 
She's posted a link to Brian's book on our website and she's given us a very kind 10% discount for all the participants this evening. Um, and finally, just before I finish up, as Ruth mentioned, if there is anything that somebody wants to ask um, and they don't feel comfortable in this forum asking, we do have a DLP, a designated liaison person in the club, John Birmingham. Unfortunately, John has a clash with this evening. So Kenny Morgan is going to jump on just at the very end of the call, probably maybe around five to eight for 30 seconds or a minute, just to explain the role and to let people know that if you want to get in touch with our DLP, either John or indeed Kenny confidentially, to look for some support within the club from any perspective of mental health, addiction or any other supports, please do so. The GA is all about community and it's all about family and we have a fantastic family here in Trim. So without further ado, I'm going to hand you over to Brian for his fantastic story. Sorry, Brian, I'm going to cut across you for one second and just can I just ask everyone to turn off their cameras, please? Thanks very much. Just that we're recording tonight um, and we want to be able to post it up on social media. So thank, thank you very much. Super. Thanks, Ruth. Thanks a lot, Eric, for the intro. Um, I, I, do you know what, where I want to start, guys, is really about, it. Derek mentioned uh, my book that was published last year, and the whole idea of this talk today is going to be hanging on this idea of letting go what you cannot control, and I probably got the biggest lesson of my life when the book was published last year. So it was the 29th of March, I was due to go on to the Late Late Show, the Ryan Turbody Show, and I was really excited. I put my blood, sweat, and tears into that book for the space in in this the space of a year before that. And with COVID kicking in, I didn't know what was. Nobody knew what was going to happen. But I got news in the space of a few hours that the Late Late Show was cancelled. My book launch was cancelled. The bookshops closed, and I basically I couldn't even sell online books because all of the books were trapped in Gill, the publishers, and I couldn't even get access to the books to to give them to the shops. So I don't know what I was supposed to do in that moment, <laughs> probably start crying, wallowing self-pity, I'm not too sure. But I found myself actually smiling and looking out the window. And I wasn't smiling because I wasn't able to sell me books or I was, was couldn't go on the Ryan Turbody show. I really wanted to do that. I was smiling at my ability to let go of what was outside of my control. <clears throat> and in essence, I was living the truth of what was in the book. I caught myself getting emotionally hijacked and I was able to catch it in its tracks and focus on what I could control, my response to the situation. So the whole talk today is really going to focus on that. But I want to give you a quick story, a quick little narrative of, of how I got to where I am today. So as, as Derek mentioned, I spent a lot of my life in addiction. I spent 18 years as a heroin addict, 15 years chronically addicted to heroin. I was on a methadone program for 12 of those, those years. And I just want to share an image an image with you guys and um, just to let you see so that's it that's a picture of me on the left and um, two years before i hit rock bottom from 15 years of chronic heroin addiction and what what, what i'd like to get across to people is that heroin was not my problem drugs were not even my problem i was consumed by overthinking and tormented by my own mind and tormented by anxiety and I, i'm not saying i didn't have a choice but in that moment I use drugs to help me to help me to recover. I start using drugs at 14. By the time I was 15, 16, my anxiety was up to all, all kinds of horrific levels. I was having panic attacks. And I when I found heroin for the first time, I planned to do it once. But that once turned into many times as I just tried to medicate myself. But to make this story a little bit more relatable to you guys as well, is that I was a functional addict for much of that time. Even in that picture there on the left hand side. I was still working in a job. I was working in a graphics industry, in the printing industry, doing graphics for pharmaceuticals of all things. And I, I was I was what's called a functional addict. So you might know somebody with alcohol issues. You might know someone with drug issues. So I just wanted just to, so this talk could relate to you a little bit more that you don't need to be a heroin addict to get the, to get the benefits of this, of this, um, of this talk basically. So, um, for me, I, I I spent all of those years in addiction, and um, by the end, I said I was a functional addict, but in the end, I stopped functioning. I lost everything. I lost my job. I lost my mind. I lost my health, as you can see there, and I lost every important relationship in my life. That was in August 2014, and it was time for me to sink or swim. It really was. It was death, just time to sink or swim. That's, that's all I had to live or die. I hadn't really got much of a choice. 
And I decided to try to get into a into a detox facility and to get off drugs for good for the very first time. And I was told that there wasn't a detox facility available that I would have had to wait eight weeks because I needed to come off benzodiazepine, which I know as Valium. I needed to come off them first. So I just remember thinking to myself, I, I won't be alive in eight weeks. Like I'm I'm on death's door here. I need to do this now or else I'm going to change my mind. And there was something just driving me on the inside telling me you've got to do this now. So I remember saying, right, I'll do a detox at home so I could do a detox to get into a proper detox facility to get off methadone. And two days into that home, and I done a home detox, two days into the home detox was not only the most painful night in my life, it was also the most important. I woke up on my sitting room floor and there was blood everywhere. And what had happened was I had a grand mal convulsive seizure from coming off the Valium too quickly. And I had driven my teeth down the center of my tongue. Now it was an absolutely horrific experience. My poor family who, my brother was staying in the house with me, thought I was dead. He rang my parents to say, I think Brian's dead. It was absolutely crazy, crazy night ambulance called to the house rushed the hospital and i don't remember much of that night but i do remember waking up in the hospital several hours later and this is the moment that i describe as 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 the most important night in my life i woke up in the hospital lying on a trolley and my legs were kind of I, I, I was lying down and i was emotionally mentally and physically broken anxiety was literally just coursing through my body and I remember just wanting to jump out my own skin and I was saying to myself, how can I escape? How can I get away from myself? How can I get away from this? And I was just I was just absolutely broken. And I remember just pulling myself up on, a tro- up on the trolley and my legs dangling off the side. And my eyes just fixated on this red fire extinguisher that was on the wall. And I remember just looking at it. It was like I was lost in tunnel vision, just sort of transfixed by this fire extinguisher. And I was looking at it and I was saying to myself, that's the colour red. And that's 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 a fire extinguisher. But I couldn't put the concept together. I couldn't put sent the sentence together and say what what I was looking at. And I remember sort of getting panicked and looking around the rest of the room and trying to name objects in the room and trying to verbalize my surroundings to myself. And nothing made sense. It was like words didn't make sense to me anymore. And I remember just thinking to myself, oh, my God, that's brain damage. That's done. You're done. Game over. You're brain damaged. You've done it now. And I remember just thinking, waiting for the anxiety and the panic attacks, the thing that drove my whole addiction. I was waiting to be overwhelmed by this. But I just remember lying back down on the trolley in the hospital and saying to myself, I can't do this anymore. I am done. I I can't fight this anymore. You win. I am done. I give up. I surrender. I can't do this. And this is what I describe as the most important night of my life. It was the first time that I stopped fighting with my own mind, stopped resisting reality, and I put up the white flag. And this allowed me to change, look at the world from a completely new perspective. Now, there was a bit more of a journey in that. I had another four weeks in detox in a home. I had another five weeks um, in, in when I finally got into a detox facility to go off methadone. Not a tough five, tough five weeks in there. But while I was in that detox facility, there was like a shift in me being. The fire extinguisher incident, I believe, was like a chink in the armor that helped me to look at the world another way. But with the drugs coming out of my system, all of a sudden it was like there was a shift in my perspective. And I remember it was like this little, little whisper in my mind, you might actually have a life again. And I remember for the first time ever getting into mindfulness, getting into Eastern philosophy, learning about self, reading all these books while I was in detox. And I was actually, I was just absolutely fascinated by this way of looking at the world, something I'd never looked at before. And it was just this complete shift in perspective that just changed my worldview. Now, there was a moment on the 8th of October, 2013, that's my first official day clean. And I remember walking out into the into the in the morning. We were the detox facility was on a farm, and I remember walking out onto the in, in the morning that morning. I was up before everyone else, and I was walking around the farm, just sort of going for a little stroll. And I'll never forget it. It was just this beautiful October dew-soaked morning. The sun was coming up behind the the tree line, the autumn tree line. And I remember it was just like the world was just so alive. I didn't know what it was. It was just everything about the world was just so alive. I remember the, the dew drops on the grass. It's something that I'll never forget. They were just like diamonds sparkling on the on the on the grass and the mist. It was like nature itself was actually breathing on me. Now 
I left the detox facility and I kept on reading the books. I went to treatment and I was learning about mindfulness and different things like that. And I was fascinated by why I had this profound experience of why I felt so mesmerized and fully in the moment. And what I came to realize was that through whatever I went through, that when my mind went quiet, my mind went quiet, it forced into this quietness. And it was like anxiety left me and all difficult emotions left me. Now, this set me off on a journey of asking myself a few questions. Why did I suffer? Why don't I suffer anymore? How can I share this with other people? And I just had this insatiable thirst and curiosity to learn about these things. And it just set me off on this tremendous journey over the last few years where amazing things really have come into my life. I, I went and got a degree in psychology. I, 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 I'm always looking, I'm going to be, I'm always looking for these, these, these ways to help people from suffering. And I'm, I'm, I'm really obsessed. I could say obsessed about this relationship between anxiety, negative emotions, self-talk and the language that we speak to ourselves and negative thinking that we have. But I went and done a degree in psychology. I've, I, I then got a scholarship for Trinity College Dublin. I'm in my final year doing a PhD there now. And I got great lecture. I got really great opportunities to lecture in Trinity College and UCD as well. And I've gone on to just create online courses, public speaking and stuff like that as well. But then last year, as I mentioned, I also uh, wrote my book Bonus Time. And what bonus time means for me is that I was given a second chance at life and I'm living on bonus time. There's many elements of what bonus time is for me. I don't compare myself to others. I don't get caught up in my thoughts. I dream big, I embrace failure, I laugh at rejection, and I, I, I live boldly. But one of the biggest things that I, what, that I learned was that I let go of things that are outside of my control. And back to what happened there last year on the 29th of December, or the week building up to that, I didn't let the whole book launch thing affect me because I focused on my response to the situation. And over the last year, by focusing on what I can do in a challenging situation, I've had the best year of my life. And it's really been an incredible year. And I don't say that lightly. I've had my challenges. Two years of PhD work ruined. I got to COVID over Christmas. So negative things have happened. But by focusing on what I can control and leaning into adversity, and I'm going to be talking about a few of the tools that really helped me this year. I'm going to be talking about them now. But I've really been able to tick off 2020 and the early part of this year as a good year because I focused on what I could control. Now the first, and I'll talk about a couple of tips, and the first tip, the first of three takeaways that I want to give away tonight is this idea from Stephen Covey's book, it's behind me there, it's called Seven Habits of Highly Effective People, and it's a tremendous book, but there was an idea in this book called The Circle of Concern and The Circle of Influence. The circle of concern are the things we are concerned about, but that we have no control over. Lockdown, COVID-19, the political situation, what people put on social media, the behaviours, the attitudes of other people, what other people say, what other people do. These are things we are concerned about, but we have no control over. And if you're struggling in some way right now, anxiety, stress, depression, I put my life on it that the things that are bothering you are in that circle of concern. They are things you have no control over, but by by by... By default, we try to control the uncontrollables. We try to focus on what we can't control because these are the things that are caught, that's causing us stress in our lives. But we need to let go of that. Now, what we can do is focal, focus on the circle of influence. The circle of influence are the things that we do have control over. This includes what we put on social media. What If we put our masks on in public, what our actions, our beliefs, what we do, what we say, and our response to challenging situations, this is in our circle of influence. And if you focus on your circle of influence, paradoxically or ironically, you expand your circle of concern. And I give you an example for myself. I couldn't sell any books last March when the book launch was all cancelled, but I focused on what I could control, my response to the situation. And just like this talk tonight where Derek kindly um, talked about Antonia's bookstore, I had companies, I offer, I'd done free talks in schools and colleges when COVID kicked in last year. I was doing talks in companies. And because it was so prevalent at the time, we didn't know what was happening. I was just offering me ser services out. But companies were buying books for me. Were buying, one company bought over 100 books for their staff because I was offering me services. So by focusing on what I what was inside of my control, my response to the situation, 
I was able to expand my circle of concern. So if you are really concerned about lockdown right now and COVID-19 and your kids are stressing you out or your partner is stressing you out, well, focus on what you can control, your response to the situation. Be the calming voice within that household. And by being that calming voice, you will be able to expand your circle of concern because you will be helping other people who are struggling in lockdown. Now, so that's the first thing. Focus, put and get a list. What is inside your circle of concern? What are the things that are causing you anxiety and stress? And you will have a snapshot of the things that are causing them problems that are outside of your control. And what to do is focus on what's inside of your control. Now, it's very easy for me to say, focus on what's inside of your control and focus on what's out, don't focus on what's outside of your control. But when emotions are high, this is hard. And I know this, it's hard for everybody. And when I, I, I know I preach all of these tools and when emotions are high, it can get very difficult. So to help you with that, there's a tool that I use from Buddhist philosophy. It's known as first and second darts. First darts are the darts that life throws at us. And if you live and love, you will experience forced darts. People might get sick. People might get hurt. People might die from COVID. People might die, People will die at some stage in your life. You could lose your job, financial difficulties, breakups, all of these different things and all of the things related around COVID, lockdown, financial situation, all these different things. If you live and love, you will experience forced darts. But forced darts are not why we suffer. Pain is inevitable, force darts, but suffering is optional. And these are the second darts, the darts that we throw at ourselves. Now, now let me give you a little example of this. Let's say lockdown kicks in again at Christmas, force darts. You're in lockdown with your partner. Your partner has been overwhelmed by lockdown and they are a bit argumentative with you. Another force dart. So let's say one day they come in and they say something that just wasn't right, wasn't nice. So what do you do? You react, you get angry back, you have a big blaze and row, you say things that you didn't even mean, another second dart. Then, if an hour or two later, you realise you went over the top, you said things you shouldn't have said, and you feel guilty, another second dart. Then later on, you feel depressed because you were guilty, because you were angry, another second dart. You might even wake up the next day feeling a bit off, you mightn't even realise why. You're on a Zoom call with someone, a work colleague, and you're a bit passive aggressive, another second dart. And this is the way many people lead their lives, especially during COVID times. These relentless second darts where anger, fear, guilt, they're all kicking off each other and causing us to really suffer. But the idea here is, and again, I'll say it because it's important, pain is inevitable. Suffering is optional. And a great way to explain this idea of catching these second darts comes from a guy known as Viktor Frankl. Viktor Frankl knows a thing or two about suffering. He spent years in Auschwitz and three other concentration camps. His family were murdered. He was starved. He was beaten to death. And what Viktor Frankl does in his book, Man's Search for Meaning, I believe he captures the essence of the space between first and second darts with a line from his book. And it goes like this. Between stimulus and response, there is a space. In that space is your chance to choose your response. And there lies your growth and your freedom. The stimulus is the fourth dart. Or it's the the fourth dart. The space, there's always a space. For some people, the space is very small. And then you react, guilty, anger, fear, stress, anxiety, all of these different things. But you can increase that space and limit those second darts and respond in a more rational manner. I'm going to bring it back to my own experience again. When I, that happened to me with my, books, with my book launch last year, the stimulus, the forced start, everything got cancelled. I remember feeling it in my body, a sadness, a, a, like a depression nearly, just that quickly in my body. Oh, that's not good. But there was a space because of the tools I've been implementing in my life. There was a space before second darts, before I wallowed in self-PE, before I just felt sorry for myself. And I was able to focus on my response to this situation and it completely transformed my year. So the idea then here is, how do you increase the space between stimulus and response? How you do this is, and I'm not going to tell everyone that they need to practice mindfulness. Mindfulness is a great tool for increasing the space between stimulus and response. But what you need to do is bring some present moment awareness into your life because anxiety lives in the future, thinking about the future, self-talk about the future. Depression lives in the past, regrets, missed opportunities. But the present moment is where our salvation lies. And 
mindfulness is one of the best tools you can get to increase this present moment awareness and increase the space between stimulus and response. Now, I'm not going to tell you all to, I, I don't think you even need to practice mindfulness on a regular basis. If it's not your thing, it's not your thing to have a, a, a regimented practice. I practice for 10 minutes every day. I actually have these micro meditations I'm going to talk about in a minute. But what I do is I have a five minute guided meditation practice. But I want to tell you really, really quickly the essence of mindfulness. A lot of people think it's sitting in a room for 20 minutes, 30 minutes, all zen. And that's what mindfulness is, sitting all still and 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 being in touch with nature and reality, yeah, that's part of it. But the essence of mindfulness is catching yourself in unawareness and bringing it back. If you're doing a five minute mindfulness exercise and you catch yourself, the mind wandering about 10 times and you keep on bringing it back, bringing it back, bringing it back. Let's say it's a breath to exercise, back to the breath, back to the breath. That's t like 10 mental reps for your brain. I'm gonna call up a scan really quickly actually. That's a scan of my brain in 2014, and that's another scan of my brain in 2018. I was really, really lucky to be in a brain scan when I was in detox. The one from 2018 is from the Institute of uh, Neuroscience where I'm doing my PhD. And the reason why I wanted to show that, um, let me see. Did, did, that, did Derek, did that show up? It popped up on it, popped off, bro. It popped off, right. I, I want to do a quick, anyway, I lost the, the connection there. But basically what that shows was over the past five years and over seven years now, two years after that scan, I literally changed the shape of my brain. Specifically, I changed areas of my brain. That's the, It's called the amygdala. It's the fear response. It's to do with the stress response. And today, anxiety drove my whole addiction. But I have a wonderful relationship with anxiety today. I still get hijacked by emotions. I still get hijacked by the world. That's what it does. But by practicing increasing the space between stimulus and response and bringing present moment awareness into my life, I've increased that space and I'm able to catch those negative emotions in full flight. And that really is the essence of mindfulness. That is the magic moment. By practicing mindfulness, as I said, if you catch yourself the mind wandering 10 times, you are practicing catching those second darts and increasing the space between stimulus and response. Now, I'm really keen to get onto the Q&A because I think that's really where the good stuff is. But if mindfulness isn't for you, I really just wanted to show that slide because it's really important to under, understand the science behind that. I teach the neuroscience of mindfulness in University College Dublin, and the research shows that, yeah, we all know it increases your concentration and focus, but it also increases your bodily awareness, your self-awareness in an area of the brain called the insula, and the area I mentioned called the amygdala, the fear center of your brain. Research shows that it actually shrinks that area of the brain physically and structurally changes that area of the brain and you physically feel less anxiety and less fear, less cortisol in the body, reduced stress response in the body and reduced anxiety. This stuff is grounded in biology. It's grounded in neuroscience. It really, really works. It's, it's really an important tool. Now, for the people out there that don't want to implement the mindfulness practice, if you're going to do it, do it. It's, it's an amazing way to bring that present moment awareness into your life and reduce that space between, uh, increase that space between stimulus and response. But something that I do in my life, it's called micro meditations and habit stacking. So I've taken this idea of James Clear. It's to do with associative learning. And it's literally stacking a new habit onto an existing habit. Now, I always done this with brushing my teeth. In the morning, I mindfully brush my teeth, and in the night time, I mindfully brush my teeth. That's six minutes of mindfulness each day, just from brushing my teeth, because I've created that association between mindfulness and brushing my teeth. I've stacked one habit onto another. And simply all you do is, you feel the, the vibrations in your hand, if it's a vibrating toothbrush, the bristles on your teeth, focused on the sensory experiences. What will happen if you're like the majority of us, the mind will wander, but you just bring it back, bring it back. That is the golden moment of mindfulness. That is the essence of mindfulness, the bringing it back. So if you think you're not good at mindfulness because the mind is always wandering, that means you're catching yourself, you're bringing it back. This is the essence of mindfulness. And you can do this with anything. You can introduce micro meditations into your life. 
I drink my first co- cup of coffee in the morning mindfully. You can walk, talk and eat mindfully. When I get into my car, I put my hand on the steering wheel and I take a few mindful deep breaths. There's loads of ways of bringing present moment awareness into your life. And what you will be doing is you'll be increasing the space between stimulus and response. You'll be limiting your that your body's ability to hi- hijack your emotions and when difficult challenges arise you are able to catch them and respond in a rational manner so the three takeaways tonight guys i just want to before we get into the q a the first thing is focus on your circle of influence what you can control write down what's in your circle of concern the things that are bothering you right now so you have a snapshot of that and you know what's causing you anxiety realize that they are outside of your control and focus on what you can do when this happens in the moment beware of those second darts that's the second takeaway pain is inevitable force darts but suffering is optional and if you increase the space between stimulus and response you can limit those second darts and to increase that space bring a bit of present moment awareness into your life whether it's micro meditation stacking habits with washing your hands mindfully washing your hands mindfully brushing your teeth or having a guided meditation practice by doing that you will practice the art of catching yourself in unawareness you'll be catching practicing catching those second darts and you'll increase the space between stimulus and response so I'm going to leave it there, guys. Um, I'm happy to answer questions. Any questions on, me, on addiction, any personal questions, nothing's off the table for me. So, um, yeah, delighted now to jump into the Q&A. Thanks a lot. Brilliant, Brilliant. Thanks for that, Brian. Thanks for that, Brian. Um, and I suppose just before we move into the Q&A, there's just a couple of points to go back over. Um, and one of the things about, I actually started doing it about two weeks ago. Um, and to say it's blown my mind, and I've... At this stage, I've tried everything and, and nearly like yourself, tried everything, done everything. Um, but I started taking mindful walks. And I know a lot of people hear the word mindful and either they switch off or go, what exactly does it mean to mindfully hold your steering wheel or mindfully have a cup of coffee? Or I only realized the other day, do you remember the old fairy liquid ad where your one was standing at the doing the dishes and she was delighted with life? Yeah. I realized now while she was delighted with life doing the dishes. And the reason was, she was doing it mindfully and what i mean by that is she was going through her five senses so now when i'm doing a mindful walk up around the castle and up around the river and this has de-escalated my personal anxiety tenfold i'm looking around at what i can see what i can feel what i can taste what i can touch and what i can smell and when you're walking through the nature and countryside and that's what you're doing you cannot but be in that as you said the space between the stimulus and the response, or as a lot of people are now at the minute, the stimulus and the reaction. But it's that response piece that we're always trying to get to. Um, And the second piece that just kind of really resonated when you were speaking there. Um, And I know we have an awful lot of sports people and trainers and coaches and, and club members on this, but it's something that we've only tipped upon within the club, but we're hoping to do a little bit more. And that's why I'm so delighted you brought up mindfulness. Um, but we've had Mick Bohan and a couple of other speakers in. Obviously, he's involved with the Dublin All-Ireland uh, senior lady football team. But he spoke about his Mindful Athletes program. And I thought this was just golden because that what you spoke about when maybe you're on the pitch and the difference between the winning team and the losing team, it, it wasn't their conditioning. It wasn't their physical prowess. It wasn't their skill because they've all put in thousands of hours but it's actually how they were managing their mental game. And what he has found is the teams that he's been successful with have been so much better at managing the stimulus, the space between their stimulus. So maybe when they're two points down in a match and rather than fear, they bring themselves back to the present moment and they focus on win. What's important now? That's their acronym that they were used to bring them back to the present moment. So that piece you mentioned about mindfulness, while a lot of people are mindfulness weary at this stage because you hear it so much, it is absolutely fantastic in terms of bringing you back to that present piece, whether in work, whether you're in college, whether you're after having a row with the missus or whether you're just feeling like me, is it bin day again and do we really have to take out the bins? Like whatever it is, it always brings you back to that present piece. So 
without further ado, I'm going to move on to the Q&A section because we have a couple of fantastic questions in. So <coughs> forgive me for a second now because I'm just reading them off the email list here as they came in. So give me two minutes. The first question that came in, Brian, is if you had to give a 30 second elevator pitch on what constitutes a positive mindset for you, what would it be? An elevator pitch on what there's there's so many things pop into my mind now. For me, for me, it's all about morning routines. If you min, if you win the morning, you win the day. Now, if it's a thirty second elevator pitch, it would be it would be simply this: win the morning, win the day, win the morning with gratitude, mindfulness, and visualization. You are priming yourself to set yourself up to the up for the day to be more focused. To be more present that's what mindfulness gives you visualization is great and especially for the sports people here as well like the amount of people that implement mindfulness that implement uh visualization within that as well so visualize what your day is going to be like if i'm doing a big talk i'll visualize myself being emotive being confident doing that talk i visualize it and it's like i'm there before it even happens so visualize your day before it happens or visualize your future of where you want to be but make it actionable don't be wishing yourself to win the lottery because you can't action that so things you can actually action so for me a positive mindset is about winning the morning and if you win the morning you win the day Prime yourself to be positive, to be more present, to be more focused, to take bold actions with your visualization. And the third piece is gratitude. Be more grateful. Start the day off with a grateful sense of being. Gratitude is a superpower. It's grounded in neuroscience. The science shows it. Visualization and gratitude as well. When you and that was actually that. that's actually a question that that was popped in there. How important is gratitude in daily life? Because you're hearing an awful lot about it now. About yeah. keep a gratitude journal. But actually, what is the neuroscience behind it? What's right, so it's, it's great. So I chatted about the mindfulness in terms of the neuroscience. Like it shows, it changes the brain. And I sort of put visualization and gratitude in the same bunker when, when I think of neuroscience. So for me, like it's great to have a gratitude list. If you're, t- let's say, you have a gratitude list, I'm grateful for this and grateful for that. But it can nearly become a tick box list. So what I would say, if you are practicing gratitude, to really focus on one thing and try to go deep. If it's, let's say, your pet, I'm grateful for my pet. I'm grateful for rolling around the floor with my pet. I'm grateful for when I bring my pet on walks in the park, how he runs around and makes me smile if you have a pet dog. For me, it's whatever it is for you. For me, it's my nephew, Aaron. I wouldn't be in his life. I was only playing with him today. The smile on this kid, he's brilliant. He is four, he's three and a half years of age. And I would say, I'm grateful for Aaron's smile and the joy it brings into my life. I'm grateful for the joy that Aaron's smile brings into my mother's and father's life when they mind them on a Tuesday or a Wednesday or when they do Zoom calls during lockdown. I'm grateful for the joy that Aaron brings into my sister and her husband's life because he makes the whole family laugh. Now, I'm thinking about Aaron right now and what's going on in my brain. I'm visualizing that. When you, vi- when, you, when, you, when you see things, let's say from an evolutionary perspective, let's say from thousands of years ago, you're walking along the, the fields, the, the forest, you see, a tr- you see a tree with loads of fruit on it pleasure center you're eating the fruit it feels great what your brain tells you the memory center of your brain is takes a snapshot of that picture it floods the reward system of your brain it's an area called the nucleus accumbens and it actually floods your brain with dopamine saying this is brilliant remember this spot come back to this and this ensure the survival of our species so when you see anything if you're enjoying a match your brain is taking a snapshot of that filling you with dopamine the pleasure neurotransmitter of the brain and telling you this is great now what visualization does and gratitude in that as well because you are visualizing i was visualizing my little nephew smile when i was saying that so in the morning i have a very structured morning routine and when i practice gratitude and i'm visualizing these things when it happens with gratitude 80 up to 80 percent of those same neurons in the visual cortex are firing and they are activating that reward pathway so you are in essence giving yourself a biological dose of positivity before you even leave your room so like a morning routine is not fluffy meditation isn't fluffy visualization gratitude they are all grounded in science and you are setting yourself up for the best possible chance for the day and that's really where where a lot of the research stems around gratitude and why it's so powerful and that goes back to winning your morning, win your day. Win the morning, win the day, yeah. I've seen a hand up there from Kenny Morgan. Kenny, would you like to ask a question? Brian, how are you? you well? I'm very well, Kenny. How are you? Not bad, not bad at all. Look, Brian, um, f- for anyone listening that's kind of struggling at the moment with anxiety, stress or overthinking, what would be your advice? And like, what would your 
if we put it, your go-to tools be in, in managing that from a from a daily perspective? Yeah, it's a great, it's a really great, great an important question. So many people are struggling that with that right now. There's a couple of things around anxiety. One of the one of the problems with anxiety is that we tend to resist anxiety. We try to fight anxiety, and it makes us more anxious. It's very paradoxical in that sense that we're 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 nearly afraid of getting anxious, and that makes us anxious. It's like a snake trying to eat its own tail. It's a, it's it's a, it's a battle you just can't win. And I think it's the acceptance of it's really important to realize, first and foremost, it's important to realize that it's okay to be anxious right now. Like anxiety is not a bad thing. Anxiety is an evolutionary mechanism that protects us. Like if I'm going safari next year or sometime in the future and an animal jumps out, I want to get anxious. I want that stress response to kick in to give me the to give me the strength to fight or flight. Now the problem is right now is that like besides social media and we're living in cities and we're being bombarded by messages on top of that with COVID coming on top of that now it's people are very very anxious because anxiety lives in the future in terms of the unknown uncertainty unpredictability so that's why anxiety is so prevalent right now and it's really contagious as well that's another evolutionary thing as well but what you've got to realize is that it's okay to be anxious right now because it's a normal response to a very abnormal situation so it's okay to be anxious right now that's first and foremost the second part is is to stop trying to fight anxiety now it's very difficult. You can't just decide to stop fighting anxiety. And there's a great there's a great metaphor on that that helped me in, in terms of my own anxiety. And it was just like, think of yourself in a tug of war with a big anxiety monster. The anxiety monster is pulling one end of the rope, you're pulling the other end of the rope. And there's a big pit in the middle and you're literally getting pulled into that pit. Now, you keep pulling, you keep fighting that anxiety monster, but the anxiety is just too strong. He's pulling you closer and closer and closer to the pit. So what do you do? You let go of the rope. You drop the rope. Now, anxiety is still there. He's still across the other side of the pit, but you've released your hands. All of a sudden, you're able to do other things as well. And it's by stopping the fight that you give yourself a fighting chance with anxiety. Like, anxiety isn't bad. And you're, you're, it's not about changing anxiety. It's about changing your relationship with anxiety. And that's one of the most potent things you can do. Now, some of the tools I talked about tonight, mindfulness is brilliant for anxiety. It's a really, really good tool for anxiety. Reframing your self-talk around that is great as well. Maybe we'll get into that in another question about reframing language and negative self-talk. It's a bit deeper. But one of, one of the things that I would say is, is to be mindfully observant of your thoughts, feelings, and bodily sensations. It's like mindful self-observation. It's the, It was the game changer for me. I am no longer my thoughts. I am no longer my anxiety. I am the one that observes my anxiety. So I still get anxious. If I'm going on the radio, I'm doing TV work or anything like that, I can feel the anxiety in my chest. That happens every time. But I've changed my relationship with it. I know it will come and I know it will go. So the next time you feel anxious, whether they're anxious thoughts, anxious bodily sensations, or just anxious feelings, think of it as something that's going to come and go and be the observer of that anxiety rather than being that anxiety. And a great metaphor for that to think about is like, the blue, like the blue sky, clouds floating through the sky. Sometimes they're dark and angry, like anxiety, depression, all of these kinds of things. But sometimes they're light and fluffy, happy thoughts, happy feelings. But everything passes, good and bad. COVID will pass, anxiety will pass, everything passes. But you are not the clouds. You're the blue sky that observe, observes the clouds coming and going and this was the big game changer for me now it's not a magic wand it's not going to happen overnight you need to practice this on a consistent basis but over time you will be able to change your relationship with anxiety and what you're doing is really you're creating a detachment from self your false sense of self because anxiety isn't who you truly are it's something that's happening right now like I used to think of myself as an anxious addict. I felt like an anxious addict. I looked like an anxious addict. I thought like an anxious addict. And when I looked in the mirror, that's what I seen. But when I look in the mirror today, I don't think like an anxious addict. I don't look like an anxious addict. And I don't feel like an anxious addict. But the same Brian is looking in the mirror. So that's the observer. The observer of our false sense of self. The observer of our anxiety our thoughts and our feelings and our bodily sensations. So try to be more, look inward and try to observe the anxiety and you will create that detachment. And it's a really, really powerful tool to, 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 to cope with anxiety. 
Great. Does that answer your question, Kenny? Thank you. Cheers, Brian. Cheers, Kenny. Um, something you mentioned there, and I just want to jump back onto it because um, and uh, uh, this is a bit of a stereotype, right? But there are certain cultures that are fantastic at high-fiving themselves. And I'm just going to say, Americans generally are quite enthusiastic and optimistic about their own abilities. I know that's a general sweeping statement, and I'm saying it on 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 a webinar and that's fine. And a lot of the time in Ireland, if you have any sort of self-confidence or a positive in, a positive inner voice, everybody around you, the first thing they'll say is, that lad's got notions. That one's got notions. And it's a conditioning that really doesn't serve us very well considered all the things that we achieve daily. So how do you manage that inner critic, whether it's you're doing TV work or radio work, or you're about to step onto a county final pitch, or you're about to do an exam. How do you manage that, Brian? Yeah, it's it's brilliant. I love that as well, and and that whole idea of notions, and it, it's really interesting because when I was writing my memoir and the book, the book people, Gail, the publishers kept on saying, "I oh, look like you have notions," and I'm like, "I have got notions. I've huge notions. I want to have notions. I want to tell all of Ireland that we need to have more notions." And it's like that inner critic, that inner critical voice can be so destructive. Like if you actually take a moment and listen to the, how you speak to yourself, if you have that inner critical voice, you're not good enough, you're stupid, they're better than you, you'll never amount to anything. And it can be harsh, it can be judgmental, it can be a voice that just berates you, telling you you're not good enough. And that's I, I've, been, I've been amazed by the amount of people that struggle with this inner critic. And I think it's okay to have notions. Now, there's the idea of confidence versus arrogance. And I think what you're alluding to with the American mindset, I think there's a gap sometimes, especially in the, the stereotypical high five in American, there's a gap between confidence and arrogance, their ability to actually take them things on. But we've got to push forward. We've got to aim high, put, put ourselves out there and, and dream big and be bold. Like you've got to take them chances, have notions. It's okay to have notions. And if other people are critical of you, I, I I think I think you've just got to you've just got to own that. You've got to own that yourself. And it's it, like it's it's okay. Anybody that ever really amounts to anything or, or strives to where they want to be, they're going to have notions. They're going to have what what we call notions. But all it is is self belief. It's having some self belief. It's telling yourself you can do it. And by and the one thing about mental health, the mental health game as well. Like I, we always talk about it in terms of getting rid of anxiety, eliminating stress in our lives. It always comes from a negative viewpoint. But when you conquer your self talk, conquer your inner critic, master stress and anxiety, all of a sudden you're you're in a space where you can just excel in life. And I think that's what it's really about. And other people might try to bring you down, but you've just got to own that. And what I would say as well there is Derek, put yourself around people that aren't gonna do that. I think it's Oprah Winfrey. There's loads of people say that that you're the average of pe the five people you most associate with. So be around people that are gonna lift you higher and not people that are going to drag you down. And there will be especially living in Ireland people will say who do you think you are the neck of him all of these kinds of things but own that and just shoot for the stars um, and just just don't be listening to people that'd be my thoughts on that brilliant so everybody get full of notions effectively full of notions <laughs> yeah uh, something else and just a question that popped up there and it is it's around um i suppose you hear an awful lot of stuff about resilience and you mentioned it. i know we weren't on the call but you mentioned something earlier on about masculinity and in sometimes the toxic piece, piece of masculinity and some people understand resilience as not feeling your feelings or pushing things away and the stiff upper lift. So um, how misunderstood is resilience in positive mental health? And is it a friend or is it a foe or kind of what's your opinion on that? Yeah, well, I love this. Um, so for me, right, so resilience, I think, right, there's this idea, there's this book I read by a guy called Nassim Taleb. It was a book called Anti-Fragile. And he talked about systems in the world that are anti-fragile, that they basically get stronger under duress. So a great example of this is the, the mythical serpent creature, Hydra. It's a snake with lots of heads. And when you chop off one head, two heads grow back. So literally, adversity makes us stronger. And I remember reading that, thinking to myself, right, you have fragile people, people that are fragile, whatever the situation is. Then you have resilient people. And are resilient. If you're resilient, yeah, it's great. You're resilient. You're you're pushing down feelings, maybe. You're, but you're still taking those hits. But if you're anti-fragile, you're growing in the face of adversity. And I really do think it's possible to grow in the face of adversity. 
like I, I think I was listening to Brezzi the other day and he was talking about he doesn't like the word resilience he likes psychological flexibility and that ability to be flexible within a certain mm-hmm. area and I love this in terms of being anti-fragile so my story I, I, I fundamentally believe we are the stories we tell ourselves and believe that's why I think self-talk is really really important the story that drove my whole life in addiction was I cannot cope that was my story I cannot cope with anxiety I need drugs to survive. My story today is very different. It's adversity doesn't stop me. It fuels my ability to thrive. Now, an example I is love that. Talk- that's a fantastic yeah. phrase. It's and I, and I, I, because I've I've said it to myself so much. It's like cognitive behavioral therapy. It's like fake it till you make it. If you tell yourself a story and you act towards that story enough, you just then embody that story. Now, I had a couple of challenges this year that, and I remember just thinking, right, lean into the adversity, but you can do it with small things as well. Like, my dad still triggers the hell out of me. And when I'm up in the house, and I know he's going to trigger me because that's just what he does. He's all into Trump. He's, he doesn't like Trump. He's all about politics and negativity. And I'm like, will you be positive for once in your life? But I use this adversity as fuel for growth. So I tried to practice my perspective-taking skills, step into his shoes, practice compassion, practice different skills. So I'm using the adversity as fuel for growth. And every opportunity is an opportunity to grow especially challenging situations so if you fail at something it's an opportunity to learn a valuable lesson if you're stuck on a problem it's an opportunity to get creative i used to hate waiting in queues because i was so busy with my phd and all the work and i said it's a waste of time i don't wait in queues anymore i meditate in queues and i just reframe that way around so any adversity whether you can call waiting in the queue adversity but anything first negative, world problems Brian. first <laughs> world problems but you can turn something into 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 a positive by using it as fuel for growth and that's the idea that i i don't really like using the word resilience i still use it because it's the language that we use mm. but it's really about reframing a challenge to be and be solution oriented instead of problem oriented and instead of saying why me what can i do about this i think that's a yeah, really no, i think the other piece the resilience piece that kind of kind of sticks in my craw a little bit as well is particularly when anytime we've had a chat maybe some of the younger players or we're chatting maybe reaching out to some of pupils around the area there's a real misinterpretation of resilience as i have to be strong resilience means strength they don't understand the whole brenny brown piece of you can be vulnerable and courageous all at the same time and that nearly fuels a negative cycle so i think just yeah what you've said there about the resilience and feeling your feelings is so important I know we're a little tight for time and I'm conscious Kenny wants to jump on and just give 30 seconds or a minute. But just to finish up the Q&A, we have a hand up there from Anna Bulger. Um, I think it might be Dermot Incognito. He's Anna on the weekends, maybe. I don't know. <laughs> he might, might come in and ask a question. Um, it's actually not Dermot, it's Anna. <laughs> Anna, hello, how are you? Hi, Anna. Good, thanks, Brian. Thanks very much. Um, I just, um, you said at the start about, about your book, um, and how it all, you know, sort of fell apart there overnight um, and that you were able to sort of stop yourself from entering into negative thoughts. And I know you've talked about the tools and stuff, but I just want to know how do you sort of implement those tools that you are able to catch yourself before you fall into um, a state of anxiety? Yeah, and uh, unfortunately, Anna, there is, there is no magic wand for this stuff as well. It's it's like it is pre- it's it's preemptive work. It's the work that you put in beforehand. So it would have been around implementing a morning routine. It would have been around implementing uh, a mindfulness practice into my life, and that's really really important. And I think it's like the work we put in is the value is the value that we get when we hit them challenging times. There's a there's a nice little metaphor I heard about one time. It's like let's say the average person with around mental health are flying at ten thousand feet, and let's say if they're having a bad day or they're challenged by a net something by a challenging event, they'll drop down to five thousand feet and they'll feel that pain and they might get dragged in and get emotionally hijacked and can't find a way out. But if you like put some reserve in and you put some self care capital in, well, all of a sudden you're flying at ten thousand feet, then you're flying at fifteen thousand feet. And when you're dragged into the mire or challenged by an event, you don't come down to 5,000 feet, you come down to 10,000 feet. So your low isn't as low as other people's low, if, if you get what I mean. So it's about putting the work in beforehand, like 
you're not going to all of a sudden start practicing mindfulness one day and not get dragged in by them challenges. It's about practice and it's about consistency. But what I will say to people, and I think it's really, really important, no matter what tools or, or t- tactics you're going to implement, if it's the ones I talked about today, whether it's gratitude, journaling, there's loads of tools and strategies out there. But what I would say to people is, is to implement it as part of your lifestyle. Take baby steps. Like for tomorrow, say, practice gratitude for a minute, mindfulness for a minute. Two minutes, start, have a morning, have a morning routine and start yourself off with that. Whether it's going to be practicing second darts, leave post-its around your, around your house. That's a great way to answer that question as well, Anna. Like it's remembering to implement these tools. So leave post-its on your laptop, on your fridge, beware of second darts and keep that in the mindset. So when you are, when those challenges do come along that you remember, right, I do have a choice. I don't have to be drawn into this. There is a space between stimulus and response. Let's try to increase that space and catch these emotional hijackings. But consistency is the key. And And the reason why consistency is the key, it's from a biological perspective that our brains love the path of least resistance. And if you've been worrying for years, if you've been getting emotional, hijacked for years if you've been jealous angry or resentful for years your brain will take that shape so it's about changing those habits over time re-cha- reshaping your brain which you will can reshape your brain that's neuroplasticity and over time it will become your new default and then it, it's like you don't even have to try anymore it's just your new default and you don't get dragged in uh, in anymore so i'm afraid that there's no magic wand it is about putting the work in but it's work that is well well worth it Guys, thanks, Derek, and thanks, Brian. Derek, just before you finish up, just to let you know that um, John is actually free. So Kenny is waiting in the wings to take over, but uh, John is freed up. So just to, to let you know, you can hand over whenever you're ready. Great. Well, I think if we if we have a, well, sorry, one very, very quick question. Brian, what's your guilty pleasure these days? What's my guilty pleasure these days? Um, do you know what? If it's filled, it's filled. It's not even a guilty pleasure. It would be Netflix. So I got into a serious relationship this year, and I've 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 created a lot of more white space in my life, and I'd be chilling with my girlfriend watching Netflix. I think that'd be my guilty pleasure. Yeah, brilliant. It's not nothing yeah. too bad. <laughs> well, well, I'm conscious. We said we'd wrap up for eight o'clock. Conscious of everyone's time, so I'm gonna hand over to John Birmingham, who's our DLP, our designated liaison person. So, John, if I can, if you don't mind, just explaining your role and and what it does and the benefits to our members. Yeah, so look, first of all, uh, can I just say, Brian, um, I I got 90% of your talk, apologies, I missed the very start, but look, it's a, I just want to say on behalf of everybody to to, to say thank you for sharing your your story. It's absolutely inspirational, an incredible story. And um, uh, I know people will have gotten a lot out of the talk this evening. So um, I, 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 I just want to say thank you, uh, a heartfelt thank you on behalf of everybody in the club. I just want to say as well, you know, Derek uh, mentioned uh, about the Healthy Club earlier on. I'd like to just sort of emphasize that, you know, that is a really important initiative and this this stitches in very well in terms of the Healthy Club initiative that that the club is trying to run. And it's not just about the members in the club, it's really about providing a healthy outlet for for our community. Uh, And it's great to see some members uh, of the wider community uh, in attendance tonight and participating in, in, in this talk. So I think that's, that, you know, that, that, that's really, that's really um, very welcome. Um, uh, and just in terms of, yeah, um, uh, I am the DLP and look, we, we, we're, I'm here, uh, the, we, we're, we're about the welfare of our members, you know, in, in all, whether, whether it be physical, mental and whatever. And we're, we, 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 we really feel that, uh, Talks like this, as part of the Healthy Club initiative, are are, are, are a very important part of what we offer uh, for our members and for the community at large. Uh, and you know, we 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 have resources in the club. We have uh, you know experts in the field like Derek. Uh, we have resources, and, and uh, maybe Dermot mentioned them earlier on in terms of um, uh, you know pr- uh, practitioners that we 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 can put we can put. Uh, people in touch with if, the, if, if they're if they're struggling. Uh, I'm I am the designated liaison person. So again, if if, if people aren't, you know, I, I, I want to want to reach out to to somebody in the club, they can reach out to to myself on a confidential on, on a confidential basis also. So we're here really to facilitate um, 
uh, people who are in the club or in the community who are struggling uh, and we can put them in touch with the right resources. And I think that's really, I suppose, the message that we want to get out. I think Ruth might share the, the contact details uh, as part of the, I think the the the, uh, the presentation has been recorded. So um, by all means, just reach out to us. We're there to help and you know, we will we will do whatever we can to put people in, the, in you know, in, in touch with, the, you know, uh, and support uh, our, our uh, members and, and the community. Uh, and I think that's really the the message that, that that I suppose what the DLP is really about. Um, I suppose uh, again, just to wrap up from my perspective, look, I, I like I, I got an awful lot out of this, Brian. I think you're just a, a you know an inspirational person. Uh, I'm going out now to to win the morning and fill myself up with notions uh, <laughs> early in the morning. Yeah, notions and coffee, John. Notions and coffee, yeah, uh, uh, and an early start. Win the day, win the morning, win the day. Brilliant. Well, I think on, on that note, um, it's just to say again, Brian, a heartfelt thanks from everybody in the Trim community, everybody in Trim GAA, LGFA and the Camogie Association. Um, I always love listening to you. I love listening to your podcasts and it's been a pleasure um, to host this evening. So thanks once again. Thanks so much, Derek. Thanks. Thanks, guys. Thanks, Brian. Thank you. Really appreciate the engagement. Brilliant. Thanks, Brian. Thanks, man. Thanks, Brian. Really appreciate it. Bye, guys. Have a nice night. Bye, Brian. Bye, bye. Chat soon. Bye, bye. Thank you. Thanks very much. Thank you very much. Thanks a million.